Hi. So I had to take some notes for this one because it's kind of big. I've had some barriers in properly applying myself to this project. And I know I'm supposed to do it, but that's part of the problem. It's one of the barriers. It's one of my denials. <laughs> yeah, well, it is the chapter on denial. And we'll come back to that one because I had to go deeper to start breaking down this wall and be authentic and genuine in my purpose here and my promise to you. And in digging down and trying to figure out why I'm blocked up, why I cannot participate in this the way I should, in the way I committed to, in the way I promised. And uh, I had to really dig hard. And I've recently been blessed with the opportunity to have my sister and her family stay with me in between their ending a rental and moving into a home they're buying. And her husband, wonderful, wonderful man, is one of my catalysts. And it was hard fought. And I appreciate him greatly to this day for the battle he subjected himself to in his attempts to just puncture the can of my indoctrination just a little bit. And I had put some thought around that and thinking maybe there's some denials there, maybe there's something there that's in my way. And I had to go back further than that to a place I don't go. There's a deep well of grief and loss in that place. And we all got through it the way we could. And I've always known that there's a slight possibility that I contributed in the wrong words or didn't say the right thing. I didn't make the right move at the right time to have helped him make a different decision. But he made the decision that he made and well, we all had to deal with it and that is a really dark place where I have avoided going for a very long time. But in doing that, I have brought myself huge barriers because there was a lot of stuff there. There was a huge catalyst there. That was the first person to introduce me to the thought process that the Christian church was wrong. Oh, a battle ensued that night. And she won. It was her house. I was 17. <laughs> and I didn't want to go home. <laughs> I didn't understand. I laughed and I smiled. and I didn't understand. But the words were zingy to me. I had a physiological response that wasn't negative. It was very alarming that I could feel something so powerfully known just from somebody else's words and they were terrifying words because they were completely ever against everything anti everything of my whole life and they were terrifying words because if they were true and if these things really happened these words that she was speaking that meant my entire existence was a lie. So why are we here? Why am I having these words for you today? Well, we're at a midpoint. I like to do kind of a review when I reach the midpoint of things to make sure that I'm on track and I'm authentic and genuine because that was one of my goals for this. And I had to put some time in truth around barriers of me not doing this right. 
and being honest with you in the fact that I have not been doing this right. And I've had huge walls and I could not figure out why. So part of the mid-review was figuring out why. This is a chapter on denial. So I went straight to question one, reworded it a little bit, and said, how is this class helping me at this point? And the first place that my brain went now that it's reconnected, it went to authenticity. Because that has been a driving factor of mine since 2017. I did stress that date. And there's a reason. We're in 2018 now. And I've been on this journey a little over a year, year and a half, with a ver variety of different phases that have brought me to where I'm at right now. Well, that authenticity was lacking. And I don't want any truth, any lie in my truth, so I have to dig further to figure out why is that authenticity lacking. I don't want to talk about this. Y'all are just going to think I'm absolutely out of my mind here in a couple minutes, but... This is a lifetime of getting to this moment. So, when we're digging into the past and answering the questions previously, and I, I reiterated that too, I had to really dig to do this because I've been living in recovery for a while now. Arrogant, cocky, that was all ego. Shame on me. Of course there's more on the surface. So while digging into the past, I'm overlooking the past as time is as it is it's all past in some level or present or future at the same time i was overlooking huge parts of it and i had to get to the unresolved denial so i have to write this down so i apologize if it looks like i'm reading because i never want it to appear to you that i'm unprepared to speak with you but this is pretty big and I had to write it down just to make sure. In fact, I had to I had to write it down and then I had to say it out loud and then I had to read it and then I had to meditate on it and make sure I wasn't out of my mind that this is actually connecting together all these years later and that this is real and so I had to write it down. So, when I was 17, as all 17 year olds do, I got engaged. I got engaged a lot in my life. Only got married once. We won't talk about that right now. But that first one, back when I was 17, that was at a time where there was a lot of grief and loss and trauma. We coped with it with everything. <laughs> everything substance related. And his mom's name was Star Jordan. She had named her, changed her name to Star, and she had a very specific words about that. They were wild words. I had never heard anything like that stuff before, and it just seemed so normal. But at the same time, this can this juice can that was the indoctrination of my life nothing could get past the pressurized tin can and she was up there with a can opener y'all like just mm, trying to pop holes in my head just to, anything to release the pressure and let something in something in besides spewing forth sunday school nonsense that i didn't even believe but i didn't know what i believed back then i knew we all hurt that's what we knew so it was really easy for the things that she was saying to be ignored or not taken seriously. Star Jordan was my introduction to the name Nostradamus. 
She said some stuff. And it was getting through that tin can. I just didn't want her to know. I was arrogant. I was 17. I was running from everything, tripping on ego, high on everything. We all were. We were going through a tremendous loss, and we all were. It made it easier for me to take these, these Nostradamus words of hers and you know, track it up to, it's the rum, it's the weed, it's the shrooms, it's the sin, any number of things that it could have been because we were doing everything, everything to run from that pain. And she was telling me some pretty amazing stuff. I laughed and I pretended that I understood, but I always watched and listened for what she described of his words to happen. I wasn't sure, and it always stayed. No matter how hard I tried to push it out of my way, no matter how hard I tried to pretend she was crazy, no matter how hard I tried to pretend that that's anti-God and all this other rubbish that had been shoved into my head my whole life by others than myself, I couldn't shake it. And I always watched and waited, and I was just terrified she was right. Because if she was right, everything I knew was a lie. You know, it would have been a whole lot easier to handle that at 17 than it has been in the last six or seven months. But hey, I'd had enough awakening to know everything was a jacked up lie. I just didn't really have enough to know. Well, in my family, I was forbidden to look at the stars. I wanted a telescope, and I was told that was evil, and I wasn't to do that. Couldn't stop myself. Didn't have a clue what I was looking at, but couldn't stop myself. Still have a telescope to this day. It's in my bedroom. Can't see anything through camp trousers. But, yeah, couldn't stop myself. She spoke of stuff that, in my mind, it never happened. I didn't have any way of knowing. I didn't have the internet. We didn't have truth encyclopedias for the awakened mind that I knew of. And if we did, I didn't have any way of accessing and finding out about it. And we had many, many hours and hours of conversations. And it always felt so real, even though it was kind of like, you know, story time. but. It was always felt so real, but I didn't put much stock in it. When was this? 1987 and 1988. That's when that started. That was when I started knowing and learning and hearing it about things related to a very ancient man called Nostradamus. And I would try and bring it up and, and get information and, and ask questions and, oh, y'all. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Nobody that I knew was available for those kind of conversations. Not in the 80s, not in the 90s, not in the 2000s, and not in the 2010s. Nobody that I know. So it remained very easy to deny all of it. And I chose blissfully to deny all of it. And that relationship got put back into a spot where I would not go there. And all of, all of the work that she did. It's been a very enlightening morning. Very great reminders this morning of names I didn't think of for a really long time. And all of the work that she did. I was blissfully chose to put it away, or it pretend it didn't matter, sink it in the bottom of Denial River, and just pretend it didn't even exist, let the alligators feed on it. And I was quite content to do that until I couldn't. Because you see, the things that she was saying all those years ago, they weren't happening. 
They didn't happen until they did. So wait till you hear this, y'all. <laughs> oh, I don't even know <laughs> anything right now, which is a good thing. I'm nobody and I know nothing anyway, so it's a really good thing that I can start from that place because this is 30 years later, right? 30 years. 2017, 2018. Dates I told you to remember. Enter Naughty D. Beaver. Shatterer of lies. Bringer of truth. Seer of wisdom. <laughs> it is no longer possible to deny it. It is not possible to choose blindness any longer. And when is this? 2017, 2018. Time lapse, 30 years. Took 30 years. But patience pays off. So I have been waiting for Naughty D. Beaver for 30 years. And I don't know why. <laughs> but there's more. <laughs> First, I must say, because I don't know if she's still with us. And she may be around somewhere today. Star Jordan. I am sorry, Star Jordan. I love you. I miss him too. And may these words find you and bless you. Thank you. Now, what does this have to do with this class, right? Well, this is the very first clarity of this denial, and it's a significant of sex, acceptance of something that's bigger. And I don't know what that is, because this has been a, well, hmm, interesting day, right? Real interesting. And so I'm sharing that with you because it's relevant to the class denial, and it's been a big one that has kept me from being authentic and genuine in this endeavor. So what is the relevance of it to this channel? this purpose. Well, I'm unsure because I know this channel is a purpose and I know this has something to do with it and I can't keep fighting it like I have because it's bringing challenges into my life to continue denying this and not doing it right. So I have to dig into that. I have to. So I did and I wrote it down some more. The denial around the events, the grief, the loss, the substances, the revelations, the resistances, and the consistent insistence of that relationship are a place I do not allow myself to go. I thought I maintained a very tight grip of controlled, measured distance from all things connected there and a heaping helping of denial made it possible to maintain the sustained illusion around the haunting, hazy words attributed to an ancient man they call Nostradamus. But I am not without power there, as this is my purpose, but it is in no way my plan. And the walls must fall, one brick at a time if necessary. <laughs> denial right it's a funny thing the things we deny we don't know how they're going to impact us later but all of that from all those years ago that I had tucked away into a safe place to just hold on to as my own and never visit it just leave it be that denial has come around forward to a place where I can no longer deny it. And it's scary because I don't even know what it means. 
There's a song by a guy named Trevor Hall. The song is called Sagittarius. And one of my favorite lines in the song is, get me out of my way. <laughs> Which is so appropriate on so many levels because I'm always in my own way and I am a Sagittarius. <laughs> so I was like, all right. So I hear that in my head sometimes when I know I'm messing up. I'm like, get me out of my way. <laughs> Come on, Deanna. Get out of your own way. <laughs> so... Hello, Mr. Naughty Beaver. My name is Deanna, and I have been waiting a very long time for you. Thank you for authenticating that which is known, and I look forward to your next lessons.